Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here amongst all of you. About 12 years ago when we entered this journey in Alhambra School District, I had a dream that we would bring these both systems of care together. The school districts, Department of Mental Health and Public Health, and here we are. And so it's incredible that we're amongst all of you that are such advocates for kids and do things right. You are the champion of the children that you work with. And all of us were spearheaded by a champion in our life, whether it be a coach or a teacher or a secretary, somebody in a school building that believed in us, that believed that we could be successful. And our students need that more today than they ever did before. Your students need champions because we know that every child is one adult away from being successful. And that's what you're able to provide to your children and the students that you work with. We know that our students are more involved than they ever have been before. We know they come, and we've heard all morning that they come to us so trauma expo exposed, and they have so many circumstances, and that our kids are not the same as they were five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. And we must emphasize, and we must demonstrate, and we must ma model care and compassion, because our kids will acquire that by how we present ourselves. There is nothing that is more genuine than gen genuine connection. Our kids need to see what that looks like every single day in our schools. Our mental health statistics are staggering, that we know that most kids don't receive services outside the school wall. We know that 70% of our kids that receive mental health services receive them at school. And so it's important that we are able to provide that, that we're able to intervene with our students. We know that many of our school communities are transforming to MTSS and looking at universal treatment. We know ultimately over time that if our universal treatment is successful, it potentially can reduce our mental health services and the referrals, but we've got to get a system and care in place. We need to be accountable for the students that we work with. If we do not provide mental health services at schools, we are adding additional barriers to services. Our kids come to school because we are one of the most trusted entities. And we heard this morning how important it is for us to be mindful of that every day. 70% of the students that need services don't receive the services. As we address it, we need to make sure that our kids are receiving a system of care. Childhood trauma, we've listened to it all morning. We've been exposed to it all morning. We must demonstrate to students how to be successful. We must help our students aspire on how to be successful. We need to make sure that we're teaching every day to our students and impeding upon them the opportunity to be successful. Today's educators do much more than instruction. Our schools are responsible for a multitude of responsibilities. We know that trauma impacts learning. Trauma impacts kids being able to retain materials. Trauma impacts the opportunity for kids to ma maximize their academic performance. And we are responsible for our students. We need to make sure that we recognize that the uncertainty, the confusion, the violence, whatever our students are exposed to, that we need to be mindful of that as we work with the students that enter our school buildings. Because what we do know is that it is easier to build up a child than it is to repair an adult. What we need to remember is that the relationships that you're building in your school, those are legacies. Your students oftentimes will not remember what you taught them. They will never forget how you've made them feel. And so as we go through this this morning, you're going to hear from a panel of experts. Because every student needs a champion. Each of you in this room today are your students' champions. The panel here are champions for our kids. And we need to know and recognize that our students are not the same. If we look in their book bag of tools, our kids come with much more than materials such as pencils and scissors and rulers and books. Our kids come with divorce and trauma and abuse and alcoholism and all the other variables that contribute to interfering with them performing academically. Our children's lives are very complicated. So what did we acquire in Alhambra about 10 years ago? We looked at how could we think outside the box? How could we look at an innovative approach that addressed some of the bar barriers that are interfering with students being academically successful? We looked at attendance. We looked at school climate. 
We have a local climate survey that we've been facilitating for the last 10 years, far before LCAP. We looked at creating board policy that leveraged annual training so that we would never forget what we needed to do and how we needed to do it right. We messaged things differently. When we talked about mental health, we talked about the value of good mental health. We made sure that kids understood and the adult school community understood that mental health is important, that we all need the support of mental health. We began to recruit some incredible school community partners because we know we can't do this alone in schools. We oftentimes work in silos in our school system. We need to step outside those silos because to increase capacity of service, we need to increase capacity of relationships. And then we brought in a parent education piece. As we began to look at that, we looked at SEL. Far before social emotional learning was really spoken about, it was kind of that elephant in the room. And we looked at how can we inspire kids? How can we inspire kids so that they want to be the next doctor, the next teacher, the next therapist? How do we do things differently? How do we talk to kids thoughtfully? How do we make sure that we value kids, but that we outwardly express to students that we value them? Making a simple phone call home such as you were absent today is one way of doing it, but the way that we've really empowered folks to practice is school is not the same without you. Is there something interfering with your ability to get to school? Or do we need to help you get to school? And so that is what Alhambra began to do. They began to look at how are we going to collaborate? How are we going to integrate good mental health? How are we going to begin to talk about mental health? Because mental health is not a bad thing. And so we want to make sure that we minimize those stigmas associated with mental health. And I know you are here today because you are the champions in your school system. You're the champions for your students. You help your kids engage. You help inspire them. You help challenge them. And we need to continue to do this journey together because you're not alone in this endeavor. And it starts by working together. It starts by creating a school community in which we all have a hand in that process. So as you looked at the Alhambra system, what we did is we looked at how are we going to effectively and thoughtfully communicate. How are we going to be able to maintain a learning environment, because we're an institution for that, but to attend to the social emotional needs of our kids? How are we going to create school community partners? When we talk in Alhambra, we don't talk about a school district. We talk about a school community district, a school community district that cares. When we look at self-care, we know that happy teachers bring happy kids. So we have wellness for our teachers, and you're going to hear about what that looks like as well. And then we look at how do we create a community that is positive and that is socially, emotionally, have the ability to learn. So why does your community need a program similar to Alhambra? What we know is that you've got students at risk, don't you? And if you don't, tell us a secret to that. And we know that you are looking at how to keep our schools safe because our kids are exposed to enough trauma and violence outside our school systems. We know that we need to address and demonstrate best practices for our students, best practices for our staff, or for the coach, or for the campus supervisor, or for the school police officer. We know that we need to know how to access mental health services and work with our incredible partners at Department of Mental Health. And we need to look at how do we support our staff. Because we said, heard it this morning, you have to love what you do. You have to love coming to work. There are bad days. There's no doubt of that. But we have to love what we're doing with our kids. What are school-based mental health services? They vary. They may be services provided by, uni by unified um, school programs, such as universities, such as school-based mental health agencies such as universal treatment, evidence-based programs, one-on-one -on -one services. They may be delivered at that lower level universal system of care. They may be addressed when we look at school climate and we look at school climate outcomes. They may be community partners in the relationships that we have with them. As we begin to look at what does that look like, that requires a lot of training. In education, we are always looking at best practices to instruct but not necessarily best practices to integrate social-emotional learning. 
And so as you begin to look at your board policies and you begin to look at your system of care, you want to make sure you embed annual training because that gives you an opportunity to never move away from that conversation. And that could be training on the mandated training, such as suicide prevention training or child abuse training. But there's also threat assessment training and attendance and understanding the barriers of coming to school and student health and parent engagement and mental health, being able to talk about the value of good mental health and school safety and making sure that we're able to look again at teacher wellness. So how has that looked in Alhambra? We've addressed school climate for the last 10 years. Now ironically, LCAP requires us to address that. And so we were a little bit ahead of the curve there. But as we looked at school climate, we looked at the importance of school climate. And positive school climate benefits students, teachers are more motivated, and students are more motivated. And so we know there is a value to school climate but not just to facilitate the survey, but to analyze the outcomes of those surveys, to look at making those mid-course adjustments and corrections, to ensure that you're using that survey, that reported measure from your students, hopefully your staff, as well as your parents, to look at what your school community needs to support the success of your students. These are the success of those students being the next doctor those students being the next teacher, the next, next musician. We want to make sure that we're able to look at what is keeping kids in school or what is keeping kids away from school. And so as we began to look at that, we looked at a lot of variables with that. We looked at making sure we respond to crises. That embeds into mental health. We looked at what do best practices look like. Five years ago, 10 years ago, you'd go straight to a lockdown. Now we've moved to, no, there's a better way of doing that. So we look at that differently and being able to simulate those types of training. Being able to work with our different community agencies when we prepare for the unthinkable. Our police departments, our Department of Mental Health start team, making sure that we are implementing the best practices there are. And so as we begin to look at what we're doing differently in Alhambra, we need to be mindful of the fact that we must foster relationships. We must build those relationships student to student. We must build them teacher to student. Student to teacher, student to adult, and adult to student. If we don't foster those relationships, everything else will fall by the wayside. We must be that positive influence for our kids. We must make sure that we acknowledge positive communication, that we model positive communication. Do you know in today's times, over a third of your students send over 100 text messages a day? That's a third of students. They'd prefer to send a text message over having a meaningful conversation or relationship. There is nothing that will replace human connection. And so we need to make sure that we go back to those basics. We must practice and we must replicate what we expect our students to do. So what has Alhambra done in this last decade? They've been able to create a school-based mental health project called Gateway to Success. Now we say what's in a name, but if we would have called it the Alhambra School District Mental Health Project, we probably would not have received many takers. And so we look at, there isn't an adult sitting in here that does not want their students to be successful. So there's a lot to be said in a name. Alhambra School District does not look any different than probably any one of your districts who are sitting out there today. We're a modest sized district, much, much smaller than LAUSD, but certainly right in the middle of the other LA County schools. We have over 17,000 students. Our demographic looks similar to yours. However, we encompass four cities. So the city of Alhambra, Monterey Park, San Gabriel, and Rosemead. And that in itself brings its own challenges, but we always rise to the occasion of that. Back in 2008, we thought we've got to do something different. We need to look at those discipline rates. We need to look at those attendance rates. We need to look at those graduation rates. And so we applied for a Safe School Healthy Students Initiative, funded by Department of Justice, Department of Ed, and SAMHSA. So they had this whole collaboration many years ago. And in doing so, what we had to demonstrate is relationships. But a simple relationship with one university, 
with one mental health agency, with one local community agency, and with parent programs. And so we demonstrated that in 2008 by creating those MOUs. So when you have these different agencies on your campuses that you've got MOUs approved by the board. If we move to 2013, you're gonna see things look much different. We went from one to seven. We went from three mental health agencies to approximately 10 mental health agencies, from four community to seven community, and from one parent project program to multiple parent programs. We must educate the entire school community. If you look at 17 and 18, just last year, we went up to 11 universities. That means we have over 100 cl clinical interns on every campus in our district, including our preschool. We have 11 mental health agencies. Some of them set up services five days a week with clinic-based services, others several days during the week. They're able to serve our uninsured and our underinsured as well. We have 14 community partners from the YMCA to the police department to the fire department to different foundations to the faith community to our police chaplains really thinking outside the box and looking at those resources that need to be available. And they run parenting projects six days a week in multiple languages including Saturday school for students as well as parents in lieu of disciplinary measures. So we need to look at how do we track that data because programs are only as good as the data that's presented and to ensure that it's effective and the outcomes are promising. So if you look at a simple tracking system, what we look at is we received last year approximately 2,300 referrals. Now remember, we're a modest sized district of about 17,000 plus students. So if you look at that highest level, those are one-on-one -on -one services. That's not universal treatment and that's not early intervention. Uh, we had about 1,900 students that accepted services, so we track all that data because data helps maintain sustainability of all different programs. We looked at those that declined services. We looked at what do we do differently when we link students to services or talk to their care providers regarding services. And we look at passive referrals. What we do know last year is that we delivered direct one-on-one -on -one services by trained clinicians, about 1,700 students received those services. And that's putting aside all other universal treatment. We could not do that alone. No funding would be enough to provide those services. So what do we do? We look at who are our partners. Remember, we've got a perfect place for data to be collected. Our university partners love to research our schools. And so we look at that because it's no cost to you. They love to analyze our climate surveys because that's minimal cost to you. They love to publish all of our outcomes. That's no cost to you. And so we looked at how do we keep tracking those referrals? How do we look at the disproportionality of referrals? Because those align with referrals to special education. Those align to those kids that don't graduate. Those align to the discipline rates that we heard about this morning. So we really look at that research-based, evidence-based project. In addition to that, I want to make sure I get every university up there because I don't want anyone coming back to us saying we're not representing them. In addition to that, we have a number of community partners. We could not do this alone without our community partners. And that's at every level. And you're going to hear from some of these incredible partners this morning, from police departments to mental health agencies to the faith community to the fire department to many, many different services to the YMCA. All of them have a hand in what we provide to our students. And we have a very, very simple model. And that model simply says we all have a hand in every child's success. That's really the mission of the Gateway to Success program. We provide that individual therapy. We provide that crisis intervention. We provide a climate that students feel safe, that staff feel safe. We provide those anti-bullying programs, but those are spoken about regularly, not just during an anti-bullying campaign. We really embed family engagement, student engagement, staff engagement, looking at what we do differently and looking at how we can implement best practices. If you look, for instance, at our parent partnerships, and our programs with parent education, you're gonna see that we started with one parent education commitment back in 2008, and we run multiple programs. And sometimes some of our parents will come kicking and screaming. I'm not gonna lie to you, 
But what we find is they come back and they repeat the series, whether they be 10-week series, whether they be four-week series, whether they be universal treatments. And they're held from the YMCA to the police department to a school site building, depending upon what the needs are. Because we want to make sure the school community visibly sees that we are partnering with them. That it's a very transparent and very authentic relationship because we're working together. In looking at your data, we look at what causes referrals. We make sure that we're able to train our staff on how to generate a referral. One of our research projects last couple of years has been that we didn't see as many student referrals as we did adult referrals. So we created a barcode so they could simply take their cell phone and barcode a referral because we determined that students don't go online to self-refer themselves. So really looking at how to stay up with the clientele that you're working with. Probably the key to all of this, as you'll hear this morning from our incredible pa panel, is the integration of true, genuine relationships. We know we can't do this alone. We know that the only way that we can get better at what we do is to partner with those school community partners. And all they want is for students to be successful, whether it be the faith community or the YMCA or the Boys Club, Girls Club, or any other agency out there. And so our partnerships are instrumental in what the Gateways program has been able to provide. So who provides all of that? And who are the keys on your campuses? Every single adult that walks on a campus in your school building. From the secretary, to the cafeteria worker, to the grounds crew, to the assistant principal, to the principal, to the superintendent, we must practice what we preach. We must model what that behavior looks like that nobody is so above the students that they cannot provide that support and assistance. We know that when last year we had 1,500 people at a food bank back to school event and everybody from the school community participated and volunteered. We had over 300 volunteers. So we know that it takes a community to raise our children and to keep them safe. So as we begin to look at our panel this morning, we want to leave you with as we move to the panel, how important it is to build those relationships. How important it is to make sure that you have those connections out in your community. How important it is to run partnership meetings so you bring all the people around the table at the same time on a regular basis. It's easier to recruit partners before you need them, before you're in crises. And so we want to make sure that we are able to provide and continue to provide the infrastructure of delivering services to our students. As we do that, all of you probably recognize this, that it's easier um, for us to work with those kids that are responsive to what the work we're doing. But what we do know is the kids that need us the most and the kids that need the most love ask for it in the most unloving way. And so we have to be mindful of that every day when we step into our school buildings or into our district offices or onto our campuses.